Welcome to the Phase World Podcast, engaging conversations that cross the boundaries between business, art, and the digital world. do more than just teach a blind kid how to play music. Simply by the act of interacting, you are already enriching and expanding their universe. For them, meeting you and speaking to you, that is being able to see you as another person that they can fit into their realm of understanding the world. I didn't have much. My mom was a single mom raising three kids, but there were two things that made me feel that I didn't need anything more. That was books and music. When you connect with people, there's something when you share the experiences, there's something magical. Hi everyone, this is Fei Wu, and welcome to another episode of the Face World Podcast. Today on Face World, I would like to welcome Kim Tio. Kim is a music teacher and assistant director at AMB, Academy of Music for the Blind, advocating for a better world for our children. Originally from Malaysia, Kim now lives in Irvine, California with her husband and teenage daughter. Born and raised in a family of entrepreneurs, Kim began establishing her own business in her early 20s that has become a self-sustaining business today, which enabled her to begin looking into other places and causes she can contribute to. Academy of Music for the Blind is a nonprofit school of music founded by director David Pinto. AMB is dedicated to addressing the unique talents and challenges of blind youth by developing their musical, creative, cognitive, physical, and social skills through education in music and the performing arts. Their vision is a world where a comprehensive education in music and the performing arts will be available to blind youth regardless of their economic status or geography. With the development of their unique talents, they will be able to integrate into mainstream educational and workplace settings while inspiring and contributing to our larger community. As you can imagine, I had a lot of questions, and Kim helped patiently answer each and every single one of them. How do visually impaired students learn to play music? What are some of the mechanisms, structures, and workflows AMB established and proven to work? How does this learning experience impact the students' lives now and perhaps into the future, whether they choose to pursue a career in music or not? How do the students themselves feel about the experience and the opportunity to learn music? I must say many of Kim's answers really surprised me. We also covered some hard subjects, such as the financial model of running a nonprofit organization like AMB. A mission such as this certainly comes with struggles. Yet, these wonderful teachers, volunteers, have never given up. But they would love to grow the academy so that many other children in need can experience the magic and find their lights through music. I encourage you to visit ouramb.org. There are many ways to help in addition to donation alone. I've also included videos of real stories told by AMB students and parents on our blog. As part of my conversation with Kim and my experience speaking with so many compassionate people who choose to help others in need, such as Mick Ebling, Friends of Boston Homeless Organization, David Delmar, Hacking the Opportunity Gap with Resilient Coders, Newton North High School's Sue Burks for initiating a project working directly with inner city kids, and many more on Face World Podcast. What is that underlying desire and motivation for these people to choose to help others? not just once, but for years, often dedicating the entire life to this endeavor. While thinking about all this, I discovered Ken Wilber, going from sympathy to empathy, or going from first-person singular I to first-person plural, we. When we help others, we then have the ability to see much beyond ourselves. For some people, this action helps relieve the pain they experience through their personal lives via accomplishing other things. And for most people, 
it helps us seek bigger purposes in life. I hope you check out the social service section of the Face World podcast. Perhaps you too can be involved in an organization in your city to help others in need. If you're already doing so or in the process of seeking out such opportunity, please share your stories in the comments section of the Face World blog. Thank you. Without further ado, please welcome Kim Tio to the Face World podcast. Welcome to my podcast. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. I got a ton of questions, but before sure. um, I jump in here, I would love to kind of have you introduce yourself a bit and about the organization Academy of Music for the Blind um, as well. Absolutely. Uh, my name is Kim Tio, and um, I'm the assistant director at the Academy of Music for the Blind. I've been involved in this wonderful organization for three years now. Um, if I had found it earlier, I would have been involved even longer. It's it's been an incredible, life changing thing for me. Um, it's in a it's a nonprofit that is dedicated to provide comprehensive music education for talented blind children ages four to 19. Uh, so we do more than just teach a blind kid how to play music. I, I believe that we really try to create them as a whole person um, to give them as much resources and adaptive learning that they can acquire at, at this very important age, you know, in development so that they can be on level playing field if they do decide to pursue a career in music. Mm, nice. So 4 to 19 is kind of a pretty big age range. I'm using this as a reference because I, I teach Taekwondo, uh, martial <laughs> arts, little kids, you know, the strategies for, you know, even age 4 to 5, which we call little kids, and then, you know, 6 to 12, 6 to 11-ish, and the high school kids and young adults are completely different. So I guess it's a, it's a loaded question here. One would be, what are some of the common age? Like, Where do you see that age kind of concentrate in certain area? Absolutely. Uh, well, we, we typically, uh, because it's very specialized teaching, it's a lot of one-on-one. -on -one, so having this big age range isn't um, a very big problem because a lot of the students receive one-on-one -on -one instructions when it comes to instruments, vocals, piano, but they do have group lessons as well. And that's where we do break them up into juniors and seniors. And what we found um, with the blind community being very small, we, we currently serve 25 blind children. And that's a lot that have found us and that are able to dedicate their entire Saturdays to learning music. So we found that it's very healthy to actually expose them to the different age group as well, because as much as the younger ones may feel that they're a little bit behind, it's actually very healthy competition because they can look at their bigger siblings or bigger, you know, older friends and, and reach for the higher goals. So it's, it's very good to give them that healthy competition because in a regular environment where they're surrounded by sighted peers, they do feel at a disadvantage. So with this group, even if they're with an older blind kid, they can at least look up to them and ask, seek advice. And, you know, how can I do this better? How can I learn this? How can I overcome? And they get encouragement too from the older kids. So that's, it's a healthy environment, I think. I think if we both remember when we were little kids, I'm speaking on your behalf now, I remember always wanted to hang out with kids who are older, even by, you know, when you're a little kid, even six months or a year made, made a huge difference. Um, someone who were ahead of you and kind of like a big brother or sister who are not necessarily your sibling in this case is really encouraging. And to me, as you know, in my, in my early 30s, I really enjoy hanging out with little kids as young as five-year-old, 10-year-old, 15-year-old. They teach you so much. And I feel like I have so many questions just <laughs> learning so much about the organization. So let's actually shift gear and talk about you first, because I think what's really intriguing to me on Face World as yesterday was at a barbecue, people asked me, what is that theme? What is that one topic? And I realized 
it's not like I'm excluding people from a certain industry to say, you must be in software, you must be a woman, you must be, you know, but instead I'm really intrigued by people's stories kind of on their own. What happened three years ago? And who introduced you to this organization that you're so, so passionate about and you wish that you got involved earlier? So I guess with a little bit of background, I grew up in Malaysia, 17 years of my life, and my mom um, was a teacher. So I would say that a big part of me had always um, admired that and wanted to be a teacher. I think I've always been an avid student, an avid learner. And in the process of acquiring knowledge and skills, I've always felt this like huge desire to, to teach somebody. I think that is the greatest joy when you are able to impart a certain knowledge and the other party spits it right back out to you, especially children. It's just magical. And I've always wanted to be a teacher. And that's actually when I went to University of California, Irvine, that's what I started off pursuing. But I somehow derailed into economics and management because at the time it was necessary as far as, you know, what pays the bills and and teaching did not seem viable at that time. Um, When I graduated, it just seemed like they were laying off a lot of teachers. So my decision to go into economics and business was something out of necessity. I grew to really love it, but I think there was always an inner passion to get back to teaching. And so setting out on the path as a business owner for the past 15 years, I finally got to a point in my life where I can actually coast and you know, not really cruise control, but at least I know the business is paying the bills. Therefore, I have this chunk of time that I choose to carve out and give back to the community or or teach, really. I think I wouldn't call it a selfless act because I think it did start off as something that I'm trying to feed my desire to teach and, and to work with children. And then the other question I know a lot of people ask, why working with blind children, because that seems like such a huge challenge for someone like me. I did not have training in working with blind children. So where I made the connection was this. I've always loved music. And growing up in Malaysia, I didn't have much. My mom was a single mom raising three kids. But there were two things that made me feel that I didn't need anything more. That was books that were free from the library, and music, whatever music that I could get my hands on, even free music from the radio. So these two things made me feel like I had enough. I didn't have to have the latest toys. I didn't have to have, you know, I just constantly filled myself with books and music. We could not afford music lessons, and I've always wanted to. So whatever music that I learned, I learned from church for free. Um, so, so I kind of made that connection. How can I work Work with kids and teach them how I learned without proper lessons because we simply didn't have the resources to. So I volunteered at a blind preschool. I said, well, at the very least, I could sing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star to these kids. That's something I could do. I may not be able to play Mozart or Beethoven for them, but I can sing nursery rhymes. And that's what I did. And that's actually where I started. And Prior to that, I had already picked up the instrument ukulele. I was self-taught. I learned on YouTube and taught myself. And and amazingly, because of so much music that had been seeped in to my brain, everything just started connecting. And it was incredibly fun and challenging for me to be a student again and really hone this skill. It's so funny that uh, I know you play multiple instruments, but you reminded me of things that I realized was even part of my research that the idea of being able to teach or work as a teacher without, let's just say, the official, fully established structure, whatever that may mean, a degree, a PhD in education, or the fact that you need to have like I don't know, four or five children uh, on of your own and things like that. But something that's really intriguing about it, because 
unfortunately, I don't remember these women's names, but I know that there are stories in the United States and Japan and all around the world, these retired women who decided to open up their homes and teach underprivileged kids how to read and write. And then there's one woman who started at the age of 60 and she continued on way into her 80s. Just something so beautiful about this because... As you were speaking, I thought to myself, there are several professional musicians I've interviewed on Face World. And honestly, I asked myself, how many of these professional musicians out there in the world are dreaming about, you know, my endeavor will be to teach blind children how to play music. And I'm sure many of them, once requested, they will think it's such an interesting endeavor to explore. But at the same time, I think... Typically, musicians are raised in a way to think about the Carnegie Hall, right? To think about traveling around the world, to make a living. But is it true that to a degree, I mean, did you in, kind of invent, in part, invent your own curriculum? Or did you consult with other music teachers? Did you guys just like figure it out, almost like a startup? What was that process like? Um, definitely, y- you brought up a great point. And I have to say, as as you know, you teach little kids and they teach you so much. So I think a lot of it is putting the hours and the experience that you have and to learn from the mistakes as well. So for us at Academy of Music for the Blind, we don't have a rigid curriculum. We have certain things that we really want to teach them at the beginner level, the intermediate level and the advanced level. And we have several methodology. One method may work for one kid, but may not work for two. So it's not a one size fits all. Therefore, we have that one on one attention. And a lot of times it is problem solving. It is figuring out what is this block that we have to overcome in order to get the student to the next level. It's not always the vision that is the stumbling block. There could be a lot of things with their dexterity, the balance in their body. That's why we even offer dance in our school. Because if you think about it, if you are blind, your balance is thrown off, you know, and we've we've actually have blind children that learn martial arts as well. So it's very important for them to learn, given that their sight is taken away from them, how to use the other senses to compensate and to overcome some of these huge obstacles that they have. Mm, but- it makes so much sense because I remember now to relate to that, there are days where, I mean, even use as an example, like sometimes I had a, a couple of very minor vision related issues. I remember once happened when I was a child, later on, you know, kind of having an as simple as an eye infection. I remember just losing kind of context of your environment and not being able to function. When it comes to physical limitations, there's so much of that can throw us off completely. And vision is a very, very important one. And kind of orient our listeners. I remember even the little kids, you know, while you're sitting, but as you're playing, you're, you know, there's that encouragement of like your body movement because you're, you're getting emotional. You're just not steady. Like, you know, you're not set in stone. And I remember there was a little boy who was singing as well. And while he was standing up and I remember one of the instructors was kind of, as he was getting very emotional, one of the instructors trying to hold on to him. Is that... (laughs) <laughs> Is that Absolutely. Kind of okay? Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, I mean, we constantly, our students perform on stages and they perform in large events. We constantly have to correct their posture. We constantly have to remind them to smile. To them, them smiling and, and having a straight posture doesn't really mean anything to them because they can't see themselves. But we constantly have to remind them they're audiences that are looking at them and this this is aesthetically pleasing so they have to learn what the visual world appreciates and and in order to be a great performer um, even if it's something that doesn't mean anything to them it's just it's just part of um, honing that skill as a performer It's incredible. I remember when I was a little kid, 
um, when I was in China, that's where I grew up in Beijing. I was also 17 and before I moved here. So, so much of what you said, I felt like we could be like evil twins. (laughs) (laughs) Um, No, no, I'm probably the evil one. Um, And uh, I remember watching the documentary in so much part of my podcast, I realized talking to people, you know, friends of Boston Homeless and organizations that are really supporting people either with um, physical challenges or, you know, who are underprivileged or in this case, you know, could be a combination of both, to be honest, and uh, which would be a really tough situation for, for the child, I, I can imagine, is how to respect these people, offer them help, but without sounding as we are pitying them. Or as I was watching the video and the articles you sent to me, it's like, that's something that people like us must treat them a certain way, or how is their world really like? I think we had a lot of assumptions and a lot of them are completely inaccurate and i can see so much from a little child from your organization that they're they respect themselves they're very confident they're ready to write music i've not never written music myself and what what was it like to kind of be in that environment and then in your case as an adult watching these kids kind of flourish and blossom like that absolutely the first week that i volunteered at that particular blind preschool uh before the academy. I literally could not sleep. I was almost crying every day. I was filled with so much sympathy and helplessness. I felt like, gosh, I don't know if I have it in me to work with these kids because I feel so sorry for them. And and I think feeling that truly for the first week made me understand that if I'm feeling this way, the rest of the world, when they encounter a blind child or a disabled child, they must feel this way. And instead of feeling crippled and feeling like I can't do anything, I'm fearful that I might cause more harm than good, I slap myself and say, wake up, do whatever you can. Whatever little that you can, I'm sure will be will enrich this child's life or will enrich this group of children and and make expand their world a little more because their world's already so limited because so many people feel that way. They feel the sympathy and they feel like, well, maybe I can't do anything. So therefore, let me have nothing to do with them. So I approached it in that manner that I need to do whatever I can and whatever I can will hopefully grow their world and give them more experiences that then they can in turn be more equipped and be more prepared to integrate with society. And therefore, at the Academy of Music for the Blind, we do not view their blindness as a disability. It's just a condition that they have to overcome. And we give them the resources, the tools, the ingredients to flourish and never use the blindness as an excuse because if they start, we don't have time to feel sorry for them. They don't have time to feel sorry for themselves because that time is far and energy is far better used improving themselves and acquiring more skills to overcome the mountains of obstacles they have. Yeah, absolutely. I'm thinking how sometimes just how long it takes for me to to do certain things, right? Chores, errands. And it will take a blind person that much longer and effort and obstacles to overcome that. So if they spend, you know, if they or we spend the majority of our time feeling sorry for them, then like you said, there's no time for that. Something I I actually like the, the way you said it. So as you're describing from the beginning till where you are now three years in, which is to me working in this environment is an extensive period of time. By the way, are you full time? Are you there five, six days a week or um, our school is only on Saturday. So as far as teaching, it's an all day thing on Saturday. Um, throughout the week, I do a lot of fundraising, outreach. I'm in charge of the social media. So I really do put our students out there more than anything, more than just focusing on on keeping our academy afloat and, and continuing to serve more blind students. I think what's key is we're trying to bridge the gap between the sighted and the non-sighted community and hopefully also be an inspiration to other organizations around the world that we start with these kids, but the community that they reach around them, that they are able to contribute back to society. So I would say because it's my passion, I spend quite 
a lot of hours on it. I do have my regular businesses to run still. And, and I have a daughter, a teenage daughter. So I'm juggling all of those things and it can be a little spread thin and difficult sometimes, but I constantly have to tell myself to do the best that I can. Wow. You, you look so young. I mean, you said teenage daughter. I was so surprised. I like when you brought up that. I never thought about trying to bridge the gap between sighted versus the non-sighted community. Tell me a little more about that. And really, what is that? And how do we do it? Um, so the simplest thing would be when you see a blind person walking with a cane, sometimes you feel like you want to help them, but how do you approach them? So the best way, if you see a blind adult, then you offer, you just offer an elbow. So, sir, can I offer you an elbow to lead you where you're going? If, if it's, whether it's across the street, because they have the mobility skills to navigate, but it certainly helps a lot if they're trying to navigate between crowds or trying to get to their bus stop. Uh, so if you have that time, that was that's the best way to approach them. And I think um, the word people are afraid to say the word blind because they feel like that's mockery, but it's not. Blindness is not having sight. So sometimes it's just, you know, educating even little kids at the playground that this child that cannot see is not helpless. They see differently. If you're offering them something, you don't put the bag of chips in front of their face. You hand it to their hand. So you make contact with them. So it's through touch that you can communicate with them. It's through speaking. So when I'm around my blind students, I narrate a lot to them, things that they can't take in. If we're in a room, I will narrate, you know, what's happening in and around the room. So it, it's a lot of that. And I think society can help just by first learning and, and being around blind people and learning ways to be of help. There's sighted guides are needed constantly, especially with children, because we want to make sure that they're safe. Their mobility skills are really not fully developed yet. Well, I remember the when I was on my way to work in downtown Boston, and there's a very, very busy traffic circle or how you call it, the highways are all merging in, and Boston's a very small town. And there was a gentleman, you know, since I left my full-time job, I had not seen him, but um, there was a gentleman who always walked from the same direction. We somehow always arrive at the same spot at the same time every day, right? I mean, not every day, but like most days. And for a couple of times, I wanted to help him, and I hesitated because I, he seemed to have done fairly well on his own for one. But finally, there's one day I saw... And it's always women. And I saw these women will walk up to him and elf kind of offer that elbow and walk him through. So kind of diagonally through the street. And so I tried to do that a few times and he really appreciated that. That's great. That's wonderful. And then, you know, I especially enjoy the fact when there's one day why I knew I was a little bit late for a meeting due to traffic. And I don't remember. It's not like it, the meeting was probably pretty important, but I decided to take those 15 minutes to kind of walk him through across the street. And then turns out he um, worked at this uh, piano shop, a, a really, so he fixes, he tunes the piano as he can hear. So I wanted to put him on my podcast. He was very soft-spoken and uh, it was such a phenomenal experience because by the time you get to work, you realize that, uh, what was I, you know, everybody looking all stressed to like, oh, the TPS report and all these things. <laughs> And you're thinking, just put yourself, put your mind in a different different perspective. So thanks for sharing that. And are there any cited, non-cited guides or the kind of that exists today that, that we can share with people? Well, I think the main thing is even a simple interaction, um, you know, with, with a blind child or a blind person, it just opens up their world a little more. So just even simply having a conversation and for them meeting you and speaking to you, that is being able to see you as another person that they can fit into their uh, realm of understanding the world. So I think that's simply it, not being afraid to interact with blind or disabled people, you know, that there's simply by the act of interacting, you are already enriching and expanding their universe. Wow. It's, uh, wow, it's really amazing. So for 
one of my questions is how other people can help. And I think you articulate in a way that's super accessible, uh, in a way that there's no excuse. You don't need the tool. You don't need to be trained. You don't need a guideline. Just give it a shot, you know. And even if I'm thinking even if, if the other person isn't as engaged, and that's okay. Because I feel like sometimes we put certain experience sort of on a pedestal for one reason or the other. Maybe one thing is because we were a little nervous going into it, and then we had that expectation that has to be great. It has to work out so well. And that feels to me as the artificial, the wrong approach in a way. Yeah. You know, because we approach people all the time, and we're not going to fall in love with people constantly or not absolutely treasure every moment, but how could people potentially help your organization if they're in relatively close to you or kind of people far away from you? Absolutely. Uh, well, we have classes every Saturday in Whittier, California, and we do open our um, school to volunteers for sighted guides. They can help with the students' lunches. They can be a sighted guide for the younger kids who are not, you know, get them from class to class. So absolutely volunteering in our events and just coming to our school is is a great uh, way to help. The other way is just to support us on social media. We have a lot of followers. I've grown the academy on social media to probably about 2,000 followers. It's not much, but they're so supportive. And we have people from the East Coast that say, I love, I love the performances that you put up. It just, it just put a smile on my face. Um, so I think just expressing that support. And of course, we do have a social, uh, we do have a scholarship program that we extend to our students and they can and people can go online and donate on our website which is www.ouramb.org so we're on youtube we're on facebook instagram twitter i think just showing your support that way and we try to have two fundraising concerts a year where our students get to really put on a, a fantastic show and they love just hearing the audience you know applause and that's what encourages them and gives them the confidence to really um, excel in this field. Wow. So I happen to live very close to uh, two schools for um, blind children. I think you may know that Boston is kind of known for this. One is the Perkins School. Perkins. And then the other, I believe, is Carroll. Carroll is very close to me, and uh, I feel like I drive by there all the time. I think Carroll School for the Blind. And Perkins is something I've, I've known since I was a kid, and there was a movie about the little boy playing the piano. And, and uh, are there any... You know, kind of exchange program or kind of, I know it's a long, long distance and Boston doesn't have to be the only solution, but are there any sort of exchange, intermingled opportunities among these children? In the United States, I find that the U.S. has done a much, I feel like has done a phenomenal job in supporting them. And I wonder if there's any benefit or such program where Maybe children from the Perkins School could go to California. I'm sure many of them are into music. I know they have a very strong music program, kind of for the kids to meet and greet and, and to be able to learn from one another. Do you think that could be a good idea, one? and Or are there already programs that you are aware of that will offer something like that? <laughs> You're definitely a, a forward thinker because I, I see that now, now that you've put it out there. That's such a wonderful idea, actually, to have that experience of, of another blind um, organization, you know, collaborating and, and benefiting from our program. I've got to put that in the works. That's, that, that sounds really intriguing. And I think that would be a wonderful opportunity. We have had uh, blind students reach out to us from other parts of the world. And of course, we don't have the funding to, you know, say, hey, hop on a plane and we'll settle you down here and you can get into the program. But I think the sky's the limit. I think with with the right resources and funding, I think things like that could happen in the future for us. Yeah, I there's something very intriguing to the situation where I'm because I I consider my company to be kind of a little mini startup and I'm all about I, I feel like we're very similar in nature where we find ways to make it work and I'm going to also very quickly transition to kind of your upbringing and your your business endeavors which enabled you to do these things. I can see, you know, the smiles on your face and just <laughs> one day a week 
and everybody needs their weekend. But this Saturday, it means so much to you. Saturday also happens to be the time that I go teach children at my Taekwondo <laughs> school <laughs> during my time off. So, you know, when I watch the documentary and also the movie uh, about Perkins School for the Blind, and I know that Massachusetts has been the state that put so much emphasis uh, on such endeavor, but yet not everybody could physically go to that school or to be able to afford to go to that school where they simply don't have, they have finite uh, admissions, you know, unlike a university that can take in 20,000 people at the time, these specialized schools can only take in so many. If I have to guess, I would say it's in the hundreds versus the thousands. So I, I do think, however, because they have been doing it for a long time, potentially they may have more significant funding. And there's that networking opportunity. I feel like it's going to be so unique and kind of world shaker event. Absolutely. You're you're right about that. Connection is everything sometimes, you know, and it just takes the right person to to hear about us. Um, You know, we've been very fortunate to get Josh Groban's Find Your Light Foundation giving us grants and that that helps us. But it's a constant thing with sustaining a nonprofit. So is it, I mean, this is, I know, 20 to 25 kids and you all want to grow the school into bigger school, not for financial reasons, but simply want more children to be able to benefit from this program. And uh, I know it would be heartbreaking to have to turn kids away. Um, Are there considerations such as like tuition or is there something the family um, could do to kind of help support the school? Well, we we do um, hire professional musicians, a lot of them from the Berkeley College of Music in Boston. Nice. So a lot of our teachers are trained musicians. They're not specifically trained in um, working with blind children, but that's part of David Pinto's job to coach them and give them the correct training in working with the blind children when they first get hired. So that's our biggest overhead and just operating our school. Right now, we are operating at First Christian Church, and that's just through the kind graces that we are able to use that building. But eventually, if we grow into a bigger, you know, we have to serve more students, we would need a facility, and a facility would cost money. So we're not at that point where we actually can afford our own facility and and be better equipped for our students, but we make it work. You know, and we we've hired a grant writer and we're working on things like that. But it's it's still all a very big challenge for us. But whatever it is, we've been around for 12 years and and we hope to continue doing the best that we can and and serving as many blind children that could benefit from the service. Wow. They're very lucky to have you. Um, I can see you're just a force of nature. And uh, so we want to kind of shift gear and talk about you for a second. I read the article uh, from, I believe it was posted in 2007, that you moved here when you were 14, and you said 17, so right around that time with your mom. Yeah, yeah. 17 is the official age that I moved, that I made the big you know, immigration move. But prior to that, I've had the opportunity to come to America um, during school holidays. But the only condition was I was I had to work at my uncle's store to pay for my air ticket. So, <laughs> wow, <laughs> so you would come hard. here by yourself at the age of fourteen with my mom. Okay, yeah. So, nice. so you you mentioned that you have two siblings. Uh, yes, yeah, three children and. And then I, I also noted the term of a family of entrepreneurs. And so tell me a little more about that. Your mom seems to have a lot of influence in your life. Absolutely. Well, like I told you, she was a teacher in Malaysia. So growing up, we really didn't have much, uh, but she had always taught us to just use what we can, just make the best of everything, always count your blessings. So I, I think we grew up with that philosophy that no matter if we have a dollar, then make the best out of that $1. We have a hundred dollars, make the best out of that hundred dollars. And I think just seeing her, you know, raise us and sacrificed everything that she had to bring us here to America to start a new life. We literally came here with just two suitcases and a dream, the dream that most immigrants have to to pursue a better life in, in America. I think that was, that's 
really my story. And I think that story resonates with a lot of immigrants that you come here with dreams. And, and the thing about coming from Malaysia at, at that age, that's a big part of my growing up. To me, Malaysia was home. I didn't feel like there was anything wrong with the country. I loved the country, but I, I knew that this was the only way we could get a university education. This was the only way that we could afford to work and support ourselves through school. This is where it's possible. And that's what we did. That's what I did as all through college. You know, I worked at a restaurant. I was a food server at Black Angus and I you know, that I got student loans and I literally was able to pay myself through college because for my mom, just bringing us here to America was the ticket, was all that she could possibly do for us. And the rest was really up to us to get it, you know, for ourselves. If I have to guess, are you the oldest? I'm actually the youngest. Oh, man. <laughs> You sound like a second mom to all your siblings, but I couldn't believe you're you're the youngest. Was well, what if you were seventeen when you moved here? Your older siblings will be around twenty, early twenties. Yeah, we're all three years apart. My sister had already um, she came to America on scholarship. And so she was already making her way, you know, and she went to law school at USC. So my brother was the same way. So I think all of us had the same path. I think all of us was, we were constantly supporting each other and encouraging each other and that we're going to make it, we're going to make it, we're going to get our college degree and, and have jobs and be able to feed ourselves. You know, really that's the goal at that point. Nice. So I saw that one of your first businesses, I'm not sure if it's still the current one, is a Gift Mart. Tell us about that. Is that still ongoing? Yeah. Yes. Well, so the one thing we, I'm very blessed because my family is very big and through the years, you know, all of us have somehow made our way here and we're all in the same retail gift shop business. Let's just call it that. Um, and when I, after I graduated from UCI, I actually did the corporate thing because that's what you know, that's what paid the bills. And that's what I thought was what I wanted. I wanted to climb the corporate ladder. A year into it, I realized I'm not a number cruncher. I'm not a person to sit at a desk nine to five. I need to interact with people. And, and the thing that I did while I was in college also, I was managing my mom's gift shop. That called me very strongly that I wanted to work for myself, no matter how difficult it was, no matter how um, humbling at times, you know, because it's not glamorous. I'm not wearing business suits selling candy at the gift shop. I am just almost like a gift shop cashier. Nobody knows I'm the business owner when I'm taking care of my store. So I think I just wanted to do something to build something that was my own. And I told my mom that, and my mom said, if you're ready to lose it all, then do it. That's the only condition. You know, if you're going to start your own business, you got to work so hard. You got to work really hard and nobody tells you what time to wake up, what time to go to sleep. Nobody tells you you're doing a good job, you know, and, and when everything starts falling apart. <laughs> it's really you that have to just cry yourself at night and say, what, what, what am I doing? You know, but, but that's what a, being an entrepreneur is, is just taking risk and just taking, just setting goals and making constantly trying to make things better and trying new things, just taking risk all day long. And, and knowing that at the end of the road, if you just stick with it, it will somehow be better. And when it gets better, then, 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 yeah, you know, it's easy for me to say it now because, you know, things are, are at somewhat, um, of a, level that I'm, I'm happy with. I mean, for me, I, I'm easily contented. 
if it pays the bills, I'm happy, you know? So, uh, but there were times when I felt like I was a sinking ship. There were times when, you know, I would go into the gift shop and I'm not doing even enough sales to cover the labor cost. Yeah. And things like that. So it's, there were a lot of hard times and with our business are specialized in serving um, guests at hotels, casinos, and hospitals. So I have built and operated gift shops in hotels, hospitals, and casinos, which are three very different um, types of clientele. The key is that they, they are a captive audience. So the key is to try to find that balance of merchandise to offer to them and to listen to the customer's needs and to just be there. It's the day-to-day -day grind that makes it with a business owner, I think. That's fascinating um, because I wonder how many um, stores do you have currently? And at the beginning of the show that you mentioned that you now have basically a business model that's kind of running on its own. So how many stores? Um, well, the history with Gift Mart, um, I had seven stores at the time. But, you know, with this industry, it gets affected by the economy too. So when 9-11 hit, I had to close two stores down because it was simply not viable. So there are cases where we open the stores and we have five to 10 year leases or we have short term leases, three and and when the lease isn't renewed for various reasons, we move on. So currently, um, I have four. Gift, we have four gift shops. My husband and I run the business, and it's called Simple Gifts now. Uh, gift Mart was my old business. So we have three gift shops in hotels and one in a hospital. We were out of the casino scene, and that's the main reason why we were you know, making the big move to transition into opening a restaurant. <laughs> so let's talk about the restaurant as well, because uh, I, I noticed when Christiane introduced us, that's one thing I saw immediately. And I love Malaysian food. You do? I, I do. And then it's, I, I don't know whether it's a fusion, it's a bit of a fusion. I'm also half Cantonese. So tell us about the restaurant. And I, I will make sure to post pictures because they look absolutely delicious. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I think for us, you know, we've been in retail. I've been in retail for over 15 years. And, and I feel, I believe as individuals, if you're not growing, then you're stagnant. And if you're stagnant for too long, you'll be dead. So I like the idea of dabbling into new things using the skill sets that I've acquired and the experience that I've acquired. So food is probably my number one passion after music. <laughs> so I've, you know, that's the one thing if you ever talk to people from Malaysia or Singapore, it's, it's we miss the food more than we miss our friends or anything else. Um, there's just this unforgettable flavor that we've grown up with. And, and every time, you know, I, I'm a firm believer that if, if I eat really good food, nothing else matters. You'd you know? be in a really good mood. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So um, with, with my husband, he's actually, um, he's, his passion has always been in cooking. So we're a great match. He likes to cook wow. and I like to eat. <laughs> yeah. And and I think he has really honed his culinary skills um, and and he's always cooked for our family. And I, and I know that this is his passion. And I think for us, we view it like, it's like opening a gift shop, but we're serving food. It has a thousand more bigger challenges than open opening a retail store. But I think that's what we are seeking as well. We're seeking we're seeking that challenge to grow ourselves as individuals. Um, and I think more than anything, the business model that we have chosen for the restaurant that we're going to open called Seasons Kitchen USA, it's more of a quick service type restaurant. So we're not a full on, you know, offering a hundred menu item. We're offering the um, key signature dishes that we feel are comfort food for us. One of our top one is chashu, which which is, is, you know, it's definitely, um, you know, a Hong Kong cuisine and Japanese people also use chashu, which is pork belly. And, but the Southeast Asian way of cooking it is slightly different. So I think that's what we want to introduce is more of that Malaysian flavor of, of food. We want to be able to share that and make a chashu, you know, meal 
an everyday thing, just like how pho is, just like how sushi is, and and pad thai. Um, and nowadays, pokey is everywhere. Five years ago, nobody knew what pokey was. So what we want pokey? to be. Pokey is that Hawaiian um, fusion bowl with raw fish and a bunch of other stuff. It's oh. really a huge trend out here. Oh, it must be in California. I'm sitting here in Boston thinking, what? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I have to go out. And uh, yes. how, how do you spell that? P O K E, Poke. Yeah. Okay, I'm I'm going yeah. uh, for my food uh, adventure, going on a food adventure today if I can find it. But um, what exactly is a Malaysian flavor? Okay, so um, I'm Malaysian Chinese, and I grew up in a very diverse uh, background. Malaysians uh, comprise of the Malays, which is Malay cuisine, a lot of heavy curries and rendang and spices. Um, and then we have the Indians that have migrated to Malaysia as well. And so that that's also a lot of spice, Indian food typically, but Southern Indian, um, and. The Chinese food, the Chinese immigrants, they take Chinese cuisine, but I think they add, you know, just a different twist to it. I cannot really explain to it, but I think it's the special, uh, different mix of herbs and spices that we tend to use um, to make it more flavorful. Uh, so, so the other the other dish that we want to introduce that is currently not available here is bakute. And bakute is actually a Hokkien dialect, which directly translates to bone meat tea. And in Mandarin, it's roku ta, you know. So it's actually like a herbal pork rib soup. Oh, that, I'm so hungry right now. <laughs> <laughs> the herbal pork rib soup that you actually serve it as a dish. You eat it with rice. And then it also has, you know, sides like tofu, mushroom, and you dip it with um chopped garlic and soy sauce. So that is something that's a little bit more exotic that I think that would be well received in in the um, Asian community and non-Asian community. We've test marketed it to non-Asian community and they at first be kind of intrigued by that that soup flavor. Like, what is it? What is it? But then it, they want more of it. So it's it's kind of like unforgettable taste that, that we hope that they will be able to crave and, and grow a palate for. Do you think so. most of your customers will be Asian necessarily, or do you think what, what would that split be? You know, Caucasian or like from other ethnicities or right. Well, we're opening it in, in Anaheim, um, just 10 minutes from Disneyland. And in that particular plaza that we're opening it, it's it's an Asian plaza. So I would say that probably 75 to 80 percent of our customers will be Asians. Um, but there are also non-Asians there that, um, you know, we have a lot of the Mexican community and also Caucasians. And so I think it's a good a diverse mix. And like I said, the signature dishes that we are offering are very palatable. They're not mysterious, like, you know, internal organs that you can't recognize, <laughs> which I love, <laughs> which I love, but you know, that's not what we're serving. And right. it, it's just, it's not so incredibly exotic and, and authentic right. that, that you would be afraid to try it. It's, it's very recognizable. We have our um, signature flavorful jasmine rice that we you know, it's a special recipe that we that's oh. been passed down to us by our family. So, so we have that signature rice, and that is paired with the signature meats like the chashu, and we also have siu yolk, which is roast pork, and also <laughs> high end chicken. I'm suffering right now. <laughs> is, so, so we just uh, like this to, podcast. <laughs> we'd like to make um the we'd like to just make Southeast Asian food be more out there, you know, in this foodie culture in Orange County, because you can find everything here in Orange County. But I think Malaysian restaurants are like under five in this area. So true with Boston as well. There's one, one of my Chinese friends visited me after five years and one of her command <laughs> it was, oh, let's go to Penang, which is the, the only Malaysian restaurant I know of in Boston and it's delicious there's like mango chicken where mango is cut open and with the slices uh kind of mixed in with chicken which is something that you basically wouldn't see in China right and, <laughs> but it's also <laughs> it's so flavorful so when when would it open when would the restaurant be we're open? about um three weeks <sighs> to our opening so we're shooting for november 1st and i'm very excited because this it's all coming together and you know sometimes like 
you miss that hard day's work, you know, that 12, 13 hours. It, it brings me back to my roots where, you know, when I first came to America, that's all I did was work double shifts and work weekends. I didn't even know what a Saturday was, you know, for the longest time because that's, that would be valuable working time. So um, sometimes it's nice, you know, when you, when you feel like you've worked really hard to get to where you are at, you kind of miss the hard times. Mm, <laughs> so true. Maybe, maybe looking, you know, for us opening this restaurant, we're, we're chasing more, we want more suffering <laughs> to, to grow ourselves as a person, you know? I get, I can see that uh, there is something about you that just hardworking and just being disciplined, it's part of your system, it's part of your DNA. <laughs> and it doesn't matter how many millions, billions you, you will be making. I think you really enjoy doing this. Um, and I think also restaurant offers you a lot of opportunities to interact with people and customers, see them smile and have them take a, you know, yesterday, for instance, I would, I was at a Mike's Pastry in Cambridge and uh, their original location opened up in North End and it just packed and packed with people. And so yesterday I ordered a cannoli after dinner and after one bite, it just, oh, your whole <laughs> sensation. It's just like, it's like this thing is so good. And then you can see the look on the the owner's face is like, yeah, got you. <laughs> Like, like I got everybody. Right, right. So, you know, I think that's what it is. I think the bottom line is I love connecting with people. So I think in the business that I've chosen and also the nonprofit engagement that I've been involved, end of the day, I feel like when you connect with people, um, there's something magical. There's something that you're, when you share the experiences, whether it's through food, through music, it's, it's a really a wonderful thing. And I think that has probably made me feel very complete as a person. I still have my down moments, you know, and, and, and I think I look forward to that. I look forward to, to be able to share a little bit of, of my culture and my story and connect with other people. I love that. So final question, I promise. Uh, what's the connection with Chris Yen? How did you meet her? Yeah, Chris Yen is is an amazing friend of mine. And I think we hit it off because she lived in Singapore. And when we talked about food, I think both of us just went crazy. It's like, oh, Hainan chicken. And so I think um, I met her through a old college friend. And it was just really, you know, serendipitous how we met and we just connected. We both love the arts. She's an actress and, and I was writing my book at the time. So I got a lot of inspiration from her to tell my story. You know, even though she lives in LA and I live in Orange County, we don't see each other as often as we'd like. But the time that we spend together, we we just simply connect and we just, you know, we have this common ground of love of food, love of dogs, love of arts, and we just encourage each other in that in that sense. And I'm so proud that she got into entrepreneurship and as 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 difficult as much as we've all warned her, I think she has it in her. She has that inner strength to, to just fight whatever challenges that come her way. So Chris, Chris and I definitely connect on that level, you know, where we understand each other. We're kind of on the same journey. We can share stories. And, and I think she's a real family oriented person. Um, and I think I've, I've grown up that way. So we share that value as well. Oh, that's beautiful. You mentioned your book. Has it been published yet? Yes, it has. It's actually more of a self-published project. It's more of a tribute um, to my mom. It's it's this Candy Girl book that, um, but I, I it's on Amazon. Mm -hmm. um, it really is just capturing that immigrant story of mine, which I I write it in a very simplistic terms, kind of like talking to a friend, because I realized that in my interaction with, with a lot of immigrants, they are intimidated to pick up American literatures. Like, you know, I'm not going to be able to read a hundred you know, pages because there's so many words that I don't understand. So I decided that I would like to share my story, but at the same time, share my love for writing and, and telling stories, but in a more um, accessible manner. So these are really just more of a memoir to capture and to bring me back to the time that, you know, that I was there to always remind me of my roots, that I come from humble beginnings and therefore I need 
need to be able to connect with people that are in that juncture in their life that are struggling to pay the bills and 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 they come here not knowing the language, not knowing people, how difficult that must be. So I always like to be reminded of that. Yeah, I'm sure other people will find a lot of uh, kind of create that space and that, uh, rel- you know, to be able to relate to that. And there's nothing wrong with, um, you know, you said simple English. And I think what we just did, it's like two good friends having a conversation. You know, it's it's not 60 minutes, not an interrogation, right? So. <laughs> I think people really uh, prefer that over a very structured conversation. And I'm personally a huge, huge believer and fan of self-publishing. And um, there's nothing wrong with doing that. And I have encouraged so many of my friends who are good writers thinking about writing. Some of them are rejected by publishers. And I said more than enough about self-publishing. So this is fantastic. Well, thank you. I love, thank you for the opportunity. I love what you do. It's, it's amazing. You telling stories, you're, you know, you inspire so many people because it takes so much time to, to be able to dig into these stories and, and do what you do. So thank you for that. Oh, you're very welcome, Kim. And uh, I hope, you know, hopefully we can celebrate over like chashu bao or everything on the menu. Everything. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Bye. Right, have a good day. Bye. To listen to more episodes of the Face World podcast, please subscribe on iTunes or visit faceworld.com. That is F E I S W O R L D, where you can find show notes, links, other tools, and resources. You can also follow me.